Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. This is uh, a topic that is uh, one I've been involved with for many years and uh, one that I think all of you need, need to know about. The Habit Cough Syndrome. So this is the basic conflict of uh, interest disclosure that uh, we have to do. And I have no conflict of interest regarding this topic. I want to introduce all of you to uh, Annie Chang. Uh, she was described in a article in uh, Lancet a couple of years ago. Uh, as a champion of childhood lung health. And the reason I want you to be aware of her is because she and her group in Brisbane, Australia have done more to help our understanding of chronic cough in children uh, than anyone else. And I'll be showing you one very important study she did. I call her the queen of cough. Uh, her work is really outstanding. And this is the study that I think tells us a lot about the chronic cough in children. It was a multi-center study on chronic cough in children, uh, looking at the etiologies, all based on a standardized management pathway that she had developed and got all of the places to generally utilize. The setting was Australia and New Zealand, five major hospitals, three rural remote clinics. 346 children referred for chronic cough that defined as greater than four weeks of chronic cough. Mean age was 4.5 years, which shows you that, uh, well, this occurs at all ages of children. Uh, there is a predominance of uh, younger children. And here's the data she came up with. 346 children, uh, uh, protracted bacterial bronchitis is a problem predominantly of young children. I'm not going to talk about those today. I can another day if you want. But we're going to focus on the, what she called habitual cough, of which there were 15 out of 346, uh, in other words, 4% of the children. So that gives you an idea of uh, how much it is. So what is it? Let's look at some of the classical clinical characteristics. It's a repetitive, dry, <coughs> barking cough is the classical presentation, but there are, very, are variations that include softer forms. Uh, the, 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 the classical cough is uh, very loud, irritating, disturbing to others, prevents school attendance. It's commonly misdiagnosed as asthma, although it really doesn't resemble asthma. But nonetheless, asthma is a cause of cough that a lot of physicians are familiar with, and unfortunately, they're not sufficiently familiar with the habit cough syndrome. But it's very different. There's no response to medication, and a sine qua non is that it's absent once asleep. That's very important in making the diagnosis. And we have a series of videos that were taken by the parents of their children coughing. And it gives you a feeling for the varying types of cough that we've seen. And particularly look at the second one carefully, because it's the youngest child we've ever seen uh, with the habit cough. And it's uh, very subtle.
That's how you do the game? Uh, where want you to be? You want me to be Spider-Man? Yeah, I'll be Spider-Man too. Okay, you'll be Spider-Man, I'll be Spider-Man, and we'll fight the bad guys. Is that a good uh, idea? Yeah, that's it. Fist bump. Fist bump. No, no, slap, slap. Okay, slap, slap. Slaps. High five. High five. Nice, bud. Okay, now we're going. Okay, now we're going to go. Now we're going to go outside. Okay, let's go outside. <laughs> 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 Later, this is Maggie after being treated for the habit got. Abby, but to really concentrate watching you can a video, at least for a few seconds, I will show you right? shortly. You can do that. Okay. <laughs> so even though the cough comes out, you're going to get back for a few seconds. So before we get to that video, Let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology of habit cough. Uh, how often does it occur? We don't have precise numbers worldwide. We do have some very specific data as to how many are seen at uh, a couple of uh, referral centers. And at the University of Iowa, where I was for 40 years, uh, we had uh, an electronic medical record that could identify the diagnosis for the last 20 years. And we had 140 children uh, with, with that diagnosis. Uh, and that averages out to about seven per year. At the Brompton Hospital in London, they were diagnosing habit cough 
exactly the same way we were, a repetitive cough that was absent once asleep. And over a six year period, they were averaging nine per year. So this gives you an idea of how often it's seen at major referral centers. The mean age at both centers was 10 years. Both genders were involved. There was no predominance uh, of one gender over the other. And uh, uh, the youngest we've seen is one of the videos you just saw, who was three years old. The cough can be present for weeks, months, and years. I'll be showing you eventually what it's like if they don't get properly treated. So how do you make the diagnosis again? I want to repeat, it's a repetitive cough like of the various, and it can be like any one of the ones you just saw of parents recording of their children. But the criteria that's important is that it's absent during sleep. In that sense, it's diagnosable purely by its presentation, by its clinical presentation. You don't need any tests. No tests are essential. Some people have proposed that their children are getting secondary gain from it and they're doing it purposely. They are not. Nor is there any identifiable psychopathology uh, in the vast majority of them. So let's talk a little bit about how we got where we are, where we are now in our knowledge. Uh, the habit, habit cough was first described as a habitual cough in 1694. And this is uh, from the book. And as you see, the habitual cough, which often continues after the first cough, which was caused by a cold. The cold is gone, but the cough persists. That description continues to, to this day of the children and adults we find now with habit cough. Uh, subsequent to 1694, in more modern times, we've had descriptions, uh, detailed descriptions in 1966, 1984, and 1991. And I'm going to show you these three because I think they are key studies. So Bernard Berman, uh, unfortunately no longer with us, uh, described, was the first one in modern literature to describe the habit cough in adolescent children. Over a five year period, he observed six children who had all had similar clinical pattern. They were ages between nine and 13. There were three boys, three girls. It was a barking cough that was very characteristic, frequent and repetitive during the day, but absent once asleep. Again, that's a sine qua non. The coughing stopped with what he termed was suggestion. His words actually were the art of suggestion. He talked about other names that had been given to this in various case reports. Uh, including psychogenic and tick. Uh, he felt that, that the nature of it and its response to suggestion suggested that the habit cough was the most appropriate. His advice for dealing with it was the following. He said the physician must have sound judgment. That means don't go off on a tangent, cheat trading other things. There must be awareness of the patient's emotional makeup. It must be honest and forthright with the patient. In other words, don't tell them stories. Tell them the truth about it. And that's involved in, in, in attaining rapport with the patient and the parents. And understanding and experience in the art of suggestion. 
Uh, I also like to remind people of the uh, advice of uh, the great Yoda. Because if you're going to do this, you don't try. Uh, you do it or you don't do it. There is no try. And I think that's important. You approach the child as if you are confident. You approach the child because you are confident that you're going to be able to stop the cough because that is not only possible, it's, it's routine. There's another type of um, uh, treatment that's also been published that uh, uh, was quite effective. Uh, and this was by a pediatrician uh, who published this article, The Cough in the Bed Sheet in 1984. He reinforced suggestion that wrapping the bed sheet tightly around the chest would strengthen their, their muscles and chest that had gotten weak from all the coughing and enable them to stop coughing. Uh, there are 33 children he saw over 25 years and he said this was successful long term uh, and he had good follow up in 31 of these. Uh, uh, a subsequent uh, investigator uh, in 1991 uh, didn't like the bed sheet technique because essentially it was an uh, aversive technique and you weren't being absolutely straight with the children. You were making up a story that wasn't true. Uh, he had four children. He used a monitoring system and her, with the rewards if they decreased the amount of coughing they were doing. And uh, he found them to be successful. Uh, I rather agree with him. I uh, don't like the idea of doing something that is aversive. Uh, I've um, recommended it very, very infrequently uh, when there was a problem in relating to the child. Uh, because they couldn't focus on what I was saying. So what is the outcome of habit cough in children treated with a brief session of suggestion therapy? Well, we did this uh, first in 1991, uh, and it was a, a situation where I saw this 15-year-old girl who had had months of intractable cough, hasn't been able to go to school, had been a good student, had had lots of friends, and was very upset from this. Uh, Dr. Lakshin was my fellow at the time, Boris Lakshin, and uh, we stopped the cough in 15 minutes. Uh, she did with one our routine suggestion therapy. And that was the first time that uh, Boris had seen that. And he was very impressed. And he said, that's great. Uh, but, uh, okay, he stopped it in 15 minutes. But is it a qu that quick fix permanent? Does it really stay fixed? And so, uh, since Boris was asking the question, I told him to go answer it. And we answered it by uh, our nurse, Jean Kovach. Uh, this was before we had electronic medical records. Uh, going through manually 4,500 clinic charts for over 14 years and found uh, nine that clearly had the habit cough. They were uh, at a median age of 11, 6 to 17 years old. Contact was, uh, they were, uh, they had all had uh, uh, suggestion therapy, all had stopped coughing, and they were contacted one week later to see how they were doing. And uh, one had no symptoms, eight had uh, minor self-controlled symptoms. And then he was able to contact seven of those nine, an average of 2.2 years later, to address the question that he had raised, uh, does it stay fixed? At that point, six had no symptoms, and one had occasional minor self-controlled symptoms. So it did stay fixed. There's also the question is, is these patients that are susceptible to 
a psychosomatic illness or uh, neuroses. And so uh, uh, Dr. Lindgren was our uh, child psychologist in the department, and he gave the seven parents uh, his questionnaire uh, that goes by the name of the SCL90R, uh, and it's to look for uh, uh, psychosomatic symptoms, uh, uh, the uh, uh, obsessive compulsive behavior, uh, and other abnormalities. Uh, there were, in fact, no abnormalities, at least in those seven children. And then it was 2016 when we looked at this uh, in a much larger population uh, using our electronic medical record. Uh, we looked at the uh, last 20 years and saw that there were 140 children with that diagnosis. Mean age was 10 years, range from three to 18 years. Uh, coughing was observed in, uh, at the time the patient was seen. Sometimes they had a good history of habit cough, very convincing, but they weren't coughing right at the moment we saw them. But there were 85 that were coughing at that time. And 81 of the 85, 95% were cured with the usual 15 to 30 minutes of suggestion therapy by whichever clinic physician was seeing them. So there was no one physician who was yeah, uh, super good at this. Uh, uh, there were a total of six physicians involved, and uh, there were a few who had seen more, more than others, uh, but essentially this was something that any one of the physicians was able to do. Uh, we had a procedure called auto-suggestion, which we taught to those with a convincing history, but not coughing when we saw them in clinic. Essentially, we would tell them what we would do in the clinic if they were coughing and told them they could do that exactly themselves at home by going off by themselves with a glass of water and for 15 minutes by the clock work at holding back the urge to cough for progressively greater periods of time. And this was almost universally successful in the children. You saw different patterns of coughing in the uh, slide we showed previously. And this was a summary of our 140 uh, with 80% having the classic barking cough that's described in the literature, uh, a throat clearing cough was present in about a little under 10%, and a combination of the barking cough and uh, throat clearing cough was present in another, looks like about 10% or 11%. Now let's look at some of the data showing what the children had been through. We're looking here at the prior duration of habit cough. It was published in this article in 2016, The Cough Without a Cause. And as you see, some of the patients we did see during the first month, the nature of the cough was so severe in those uh, that the parents brought them in early. We had other patients who uh, had been coughing for over a year and everything in between. So, here we're going to show an example of suggestion therapy for the habit cough syndrome. The repetitive barking cough that is not present once the child is asleep is the diagnostic criteria. While cough may interfere with falling asleep, the cough gone once asleep is the diagnostic sine qua non for this peculiar disorder. I have no idea what 
It was a bit dramatic. Hi, I'm Bethany. I'm 12 years old. I could do anything any kid could do before my cough. When I couldn't stop coughing, it made me really sad. Dr. Weinberger taught me how to make my cough go away in only 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, I told you, right? The total number? Yeah. We don't want to keep cows, we just want to be No, no, she was tell Hunter. <laughs> I planned on recording audio only, but about three minutes in, I realized something really incredible was happening. I picked up my wife's phone and I began to film because no one would believe what we were about to see. Great girl. You've done it. Over three minutes. Hey. <coughs> <coughs> Once you cough once, try not to let it happen again. <laughs> try and hold it back because that causes more irritation mm -hmm. and makes you cough more. But you did it for over three minutes. Okay. Did it get a little bit easier that time? Mm -hmm. Still hard, though, huh? Okay, we're going to go for four minutes now. Yeah. Okay. You're doing it. You're doing great. You went three minutes before you coughed. Mm -hmm. So I bet you could do four minutes too. Because you're taking control. You're not letting it control you. So this is what you have to keep doing. You may have to do it for a while. It's going to gradually get easier. Gradually gets easier. Okay. I think you can do it yourself for a while now, can't you? Okay. Let me talk to your mom and dad. But you keep thinking by yourself. You keep control. Mom and Dad, are you there? Yes. So you've seen the video that the father recorded. That was Dennis Butner, Bethany's father, who recorded this episode of Suggestion Therapy this was unique in that it was the first time it was ever done uh, remotely with the child and the physician not together. Uh, just to review again, the auto-suggestion therapy, uh, because we emphasize this after the child has stopped coughing and for the ones where we had a convincing history, uh, but they weren't coughing at the time we saw them. So the patient was to perform without parents, sibs, or others around, quiet location, no distractions, using sips of lukewarm water for the urge to cough. And I want to emphasize, it is not the water that stops the coughing, okay? It's just an alternative behavior that may help ease, help them e e not respond to the feeling uh, that they have to cough. We tell them to utilize a timer 
emphasize concentration on suppressing the cough and express confidence that the 15 minutes session at home uh, can eliminate the cough when you're instructing the patient. Now it is important for them to realize that the urge to cough may persist for up to a day, days, even weeks, but that can be resisted also. Once that video was made and was put on a website created by the father and on YouTube, we observed an unexpected and unintended part of this whole story. And we call this suggestion therapy for habit cough by proxy, meaning suggestion therapy was used, but the person providing it wasn't there, they were on the video. And we published a brief report of this in 2019. And this is an example of it. I'm not going to ask you to read the whole thing. Uh, uh, this was uh, an email from a mother. And I'm going to show you some important segments from it. So she says, our daughter Riley is seven years old. A few months back, she had a really bad cold, which led to a bad cough. After a few weeks, the cold symptoms went away except for that cough. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Just like it was described in 1694. But she says there was no stop to it, just so much coughing. And she went on to describe all the other doctors she went to and all the medicine she had. But uh, this is the important part. I finally decided to just pull your video up, that video you just saw, on YouTube. And we all sat there and watched it. It was very emotional for all of us. And at the end, Riley was in tears. We all were. We hugged for a time. She said to us, I can hold the cough back. And then the coughing stopped. Like turning off a switch. For four days, I have not heard her cough, except for a few random ones here and there. The cough is gone from watching the video. Habit cough cured by proxy. So what happens if they don't get suggestion therapy? This was uh, from the Mayo Clinic. They published it in 1991. Uh, Dr. Younger and O'Connell were uh, counterparts of mine, and they had uh, uh, were familiar with uh, our 1991 publication of nine children. And so uh, they asked our fellow, Dr. Rojas, to um, look back in their records. And uh, what they found in their records was uh, when the diagnosis was made, they recognized it, but only explanation and counseling were provided, no specific treatment. So there was a follow-up of 62 patients, uh, a slight excess of male, I was a female, for a mean of eight years. Look back over eight years. The ages were five to 16, the median age was 10 years, just like in our group. And the mean cough duration prior to the symptoms until the diagnosis was made was eight months. Uh, the mean duration, however, until spontaneous resolution, until they stopped coughing on their own, was six months for those who stopped. But 25% were still coughing a mean of six years from the time of diagnosis. Now the Brompton, which I said, diagnosed their patients in the same manner we did, 
um, also explained, uh, just provided explanation and counseling. Um, they did a follow-up. Uh, they were only able to contact 39 of 55 diagnoses they'd made. Um, uh, and there was, they had followed them. These were an average of uh, almost two years uh, later that they were able to obtain information. 59% of the 39 did resolve within four weeks. So the explanation and counseling obviously helped. Didn't stop it immediately, but over the next few weeks it did. 26% of the 39, however, uh, didn't resolve for until somewhere between one and six months. So the children continued to cough for a period of time. And 12% uh, of the 39 were still coughing. It didn't resolve until over more than six months. And this was particularly interesting. 97% did resolve eventually, spontaneously, among 26 but only among the parents who accepted the diagnosis. Uh, the only 54%, a little more than half, had eventual spontaneous resolution among the 13 of the 39 parents who didn't believe, didn't accept the diagnosis, who said, oh, there must be something else wrong, we want more tests done. We know why you continue to cough. Uh, we have uh, learned from studies as, that others have done that there's a physiologic explanation for the habit cough. We don't have all the answers, but we do know there's an initial insult, generally a history of respiratory infection, a cold or pneumonia, some, some respiratory infection. And the result is that causes some inflammation of the airway. And Dr. Richard Irwin uh, in 2006 uh, with adults uh, who had chronic cough did bronchoscopy and was able to do biopsies of the mucosa of the airway uh, and uh, compared it with uh, others who coughed for known reasons and also he got a number of volunteers uh, who were perfectly normal and uh, what he found was that they had uh, uh, the patients with the chronic cough had inflammation that matched those who had coughing for other reasons and uh, were not and it was very different from the normal people who were not coughing. And they concluded from the data they had that it looked like the best explanation was that the cough itself caused the inflammation. Uh, further sophistication to this is in a study that hasn't been published yet. It's online in advance of print. Uh, and looking at uh, a special method of determining uh, sensory nerves in the mucous membranes with a biopsy, uh, they were able to determine that there was uh, increased density and it's more sensory nerves apparent when they looked at it in those who had chronic cough. Uh, and also, they came to the same conclusion that Dr. Irwin had 15 years earlier, that the chronic cough itself was the cause of this, uh, essentially, what you could call a neuropathic inflammation. So the neuropathic inflammation caused repetitive coughing, I'm oh, sorry, was caused by repetitive coughing, also, it was the cause of the repetitive coughing. So what you had was a vicious cycle of coughing causing repetitive coughing, which caused a neuropathic type of inflammation that caused itself repetitive coughing. 
So what we've seen over the last couple of years is there are several types of suggestion therapy. There's uh, several manifestations of it. Uh, what we were doing first was primary. That is, the medical caregiver was giving it. Uh, we would see them in the clinic, uh, explain that we needed a little more time. Uh, why don't they go off and get some coffee and come back at the end of our clinic, which is what we would do. And then we would use the suggestion therapy to get her to stop coughing. Uh, we didn't explain things to the parents until after they stopped coughing, because once they stopped coughing, the explanation was self-apparent. Uh, they had a child who had been coughing for months, and they could be convinced and empowered to stop coughing. And what we've run into the last year is this proxy means of providing suggestion therapy that is quite reliably with a very high success rate, watching the video of me providing suggestion therapy to Bethany would enable the coughing to stop in many cases of children and also some adults we've seen now, uh, just as that one example I showed you. So <clears throat> that has now become our first line of treatment. Uh, because we're dealing more with these problems remotely. And so before I start doing what I did with Bethany, we advise using the proxy approach by watching the video. And I haven't done specific statistics but I would estimate we're running about 80% uh, success with that. And others, uh, I've gone back to the primary method, although uh, by remote uh, suggestion therapy, as I did with Bethany. And then there's tertiary, which has been less common, but this is where parents uh, occasionally have successfully imitated what we do and uh, accomplish the same results. The important thing is, as difficult and as miserable as this problem is, it's highly susceptible to effectively administered suggestion. And uh, here's uh, our uh, co-authors in this uh, work. Uh, uh, here's uh, Bethany. Uh, her twin brother, her younger brother, her mother, and uh, the father who did the recording and has uh, uh, the recording which has done so much good since then. So that's all for today. Any questions? <clears throat>